there's a little-known part of Hollywood that most people are not aware of, known as the audience test preview. The recently released book, Audienceology, reveals this for the first time. Our podcast series, Don't Kill the Messenger, brings this book to life, taking a peek behind the curtain. And now, join author and entertainment research expert, Kevin Getz. How do you define funny? Well, here's the thing. Being funny is hard. Writing comedy is hard. And what's funny is truly different for everyone. My guest today, though, is a great comedic filmmaker with his finger on the pulse of defining funny. He gets such terrific performances from the actors he's worked with, including Emma Stone, Mila Kunis, Jamie Foxx, Cameron Diaz, Kevin Hart, and James Corden. I'm talking about Will Gluck, who began his career as a writer and along the way turned to directing feature films, including hits like Easy A, Friends with Benefits, the 2014 remake of Annie, the Peter Rabbit films. He also co-created, directed, and produced the Michael J. Fox show. And today, his production company, Olive Bridge Entertainment, is currently working on several popular streaming series for Hulu, Disney, and Netflix. And he's finishing his most recent feature at Sony Pictures, Anyone But You. Will, I'm psyched to have you here today, man. Thank you. Thank you. And 88% of what you said was accurate. Which is which is a good if we, if we were testing this podcast that'd be great top two boxes eighty eight percent yeah but I don't believe in top two boxes oh, you I don't no I don't I believe in the top box because the oh, top box drives your definite recommend score which is the money score so you have movie A that gets an eighty eight in your top two box but the excellent is ten and right. the very good is seventy eight the definite recommend is going to be all of your excellence half of your very goods gets you your Definite recommends. So half of 78, 78 is 39 about uh, plus 10, 10 so is 49. 49. And it's behind the norms. Now you have an 88 top two with a 78 excellent and a 10% very good. And your definite recommend would be all of your excellence. So 83. And, and that's potentially tens of millions of dollars in box office. Right. I have to go back and look at my, my exactly. movie. Exactly. So I'm always it. saying don't go for the top two box. Go for the excellent and the definite recommend score. Okay, I have to go back and look at it. Well, you've gotten some pretty high scores in your time, I have to say. In fact, you reach like the highest pinnacle of, we call them the theatrical targets because they're not norms, they're aspirational at that point because your movies do really, really well. I'm so excited because I think I've mentioned before to you, my husband's favorite movie is Easy A. It's one of my favorites as well. And Friends with Benefits was another one that just took me by surprise. How did you begin getting into comedy? First of all, you're not that funny. So right. <laughs> how did it's you, well, 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 well researched. <laughs> how did you or why did you gravitate towards comedy? I guess growing up, I always liked to be funny. It's a way to, to, uh, to get away with a lot of things. I think if you're going to psychoanalyze me, it's a way I get away with not doing things is to be funny about it. So I think when I was growing up, I was always funny. And then in college, writing and acting and funny. And, and I also, I can't imagine as I go through my career and writing or directing just plain drama scenes, whenever I have to do plain drama scenes or action scenes, it's the most boring day for me because you can't keep trying to add different lines or different attitudes. So I I find uh, comedy much more fun for me. And um, I don't know. Most people don't think I'm funny. So you're right, Kevin. No, no, no. I'm just joking. I think you're very funny. <laughs> Do you play a lot on set with throwing things, suggestions at actors? How does that work, that repartee? Yes. I'm laughing because the entire time we're on set, it's constantly changing. I'm right behind the camera. I don't have a video village for a lot of different reasons. It's just me behind the camera and right next to the Actors, oftentimes in their eye line, much to their chagrin, which I'm yelled at about. And I always try, try this, try that, always try different things. I don't really believe in, this is probably boring, but I don't believe in straight improv. What does that mean that you don't believe in straight improv? I don't believe in, just go ahead, try something. We'll roll the camera, just go. I believe in stopping and figuring stuff out. Oh, if you think that's a great idea, one, well, if you say that, then she should say that. We'll write it really quickly. Let's do a little quick. And you don't let them it. play on their own? They, they, 
can play in their own, but I'd rather them play within a framework with, within us kind of figuring it out. Like, mm, oh, you want to try that? It feels much more organic and, I, more, and easier to cut. Right? Easier to cut, but I also I believe that I can tell when you see a movie or TV show when they're just improving. It just feels like they're not in their character. They're much more trying to be funny. I mean, there's amazing improvers. Like Seth Rogen's the best in the world. Like he can do it crazy. But a lot of people, it feels like it's forced to me. So I'd rather just figure out, stop, let's figure it out and do it that way. But yes, we're constantly changing things. And my ending final scripts are so different than the actual shooting script because we constantly change and rewrite. Wow. Wow. So you write your movies as well? Yes. You wrote... Easy A and... So Easy A, that was one that Burt V. Royal wrote that one, actually. He okay. wrote that one. We did change a lot on set, but that was his That was his idea and his script. And you said you started sort of writing. You were being funny, and that was your defense mechanism in a right. way, right? And I guess your way to get attention. <laughs> Let's go back to the psychoanalysis. Yes, probably. <laughs> yes. Where are you from? In New York City. The city itself in the Manha- city. Manhattan? Manhattan. And where in Manhattan? What part of I Manhattan? grew up on the campus right across from Columbia University. I'm a I'm a professor of Brat. Really? Both yes. parents? My, well, my mom's a professor at Columbia and my dad is an architect and he did he did lecture at Columbia, but he's an architect. And so what does your mom teach? My mom is a I doubt any listeners would have ever taken her class, but she is a Japanese intellectual history professor at Columbia. Wow, where'd you go to school? I went to Cornell. You know, a lot of people in the industry went to Cornell. <laughs> really? I always find that there's very few go to Cornell really? compared to the Harvards and the Yales and the I think Cornell, NYU's. Brown, uh, Dartmouth, I, I sense a, a bunch of people. I think going. more and more so, but when I came, there's no entertainment division at all at Cornell. What did department. you study there? Asian studies. Asian studies? Asian studies. Wait a minute. Well, because of mom? Because I grew up in New York and Tokyo. So I would oh. go every third year of my life, we would go to Tokyo with my mother for her Fulbright. So we went back and forth, back and forth. So I spoke Japanese. Japan was a big part. You so sp- the, still speak? Yeah. Say yeah. something not too insulting. I, I, don't put me on the spot. I, I, when people always say that, I... I Ichi ni sanchi... Oh. Ichi ni sanchi goro oh. There you go. Very good. That's all yeah. I know. Yeah. What was your break? What was like your first break into the business? I just don't think I had it yet. I'm still waiting for it. <laughs> okay. He, um, see, I'm looking at Gary in the booth. He is funny. Um, you, you're funny. My first break was very lucky. I came out here a year after school. This is a boring story, but I drove out here, got a job in the newspaper. Remember the newspapers? Remember, uh, remember the newspapers? Little, and the, you and like the, opened them up. Opened it up. And you, it was paper and it you read paper. them. It was an ad for a PA runner. And I answered every single ad I could finally get. And right I got on, an ad. Right it was for a TV production company called Wit Thomas. Oh. Yeah. And I was- uh, At Golden Girls? They did Golden Girls. I was after Golden Girls, but they did Golden Girls, yeah. And so I got a job as a PA. And then the first week I was there, the Tony Thomas, who was the titular Tony Thomas of Wit Thomas, his driver quit. Son of Danny Thomas. Son of Danny Thomas. Brother of Marlo and Terry. Wow, you know Terry Thomas. I studied with Terry back in the day oh, wow. when I first got to California. Yes, the Thomas that created St. Jude Children's. Brilliant. We can have a whole yes. session on that. God bless them all. And anyway, I became his driver and I was terrible Tony's at Tony's driver? Tony's driver. He godfathered me and I didn't know any better. So everyone said, don't talk to him. <laughs> I talked to him. There's all these I stories. I love when people say that. Yes. Don't talk, don't to, talk him. to him. Call him Mr. Thomas. Exactly. So I didn't know how to do anything with the driving. I was the worst, the worst. I mean, I ripped his door off his car in the CAA parking lot. He had to drive back to his office holding the door shut. He didn't say a word the entire ride back. I'm driving going, this is the end of, this is the end of my career. He gets to the office. He drops the door. It falls off into the ground. And he says, fix the fucking door. And? I fixed the door. How soon? How that, quickly? Oh, that day. Oh, nice. yeah. That well, day. that did it for you. If, if yeah. you could do it that quickly, they'll, yeah. for, they'll forgive. The next year, he gave me an internship for a show called the doing John LaRoquette Show as a writer. As a writer? For Mitch Hurwitz. Oh, wow. So then my first year was as an intern writer, which was very hard because I wasn't hired. Tony put me on that show for Mitch Hurwitz. These are all the old school writers. I have all the stories about that. Boy, was I a piece of shit there. And But I worked really hard and Mitch liked me. So the next year, Mitch h- hired me as a writer. So I was- What'd you make at that time? I was very lucky. I was 24. I went from earning $300 a week with overtime, but you didn't get paid for overtime. Sure. To the next year as a staff writer, I still remember it was $2,500 a week. Wow. And I've never felt like I had more money in my life because oh. it went from not having any money- uh. 
God. I remember getting a, uh, I was an actor and I got a Wrangler jeans contract, right. a three year pay or play contract, which changed my life right. because suddenly I knew I was getting X amount of thousands of dollars a year, even if they canceled it. Right. It was genius. And right. to think, what am I going to do with this? And it's when I put money down on my condo and it got me into the real estate market in my 20s. And well, that's was, that's when you really great. feel a difference. So, yeah. man, 2500 yeah. 2500 a week. I and still remember it. No, uh, no, no wife at that time. No wife at that time. No. I mean, <laughs> the other thing about being a staff writer, you would always be there. Your whole life is that. So, And how long were you there? On that show, another year. And then the show got canceled. When did you get a big break? I just kind of kept doing writing and doing being a TV writer and more at different shows, different shores, different shows. So did you realize that you have to do your own stuff in order to get to that next level? I created three shows that I ran for Fox, none of which took off, but they were, they were, you know, I You were ran. like the showrunner? Yeah. So I created my first show at 28, so in 29. So I was very young and I, I liked all that, but I still felt like it wasn't, you know, the show wasn't, they weren't successful. They were on for one year each and then a couple of years. I always say that. I didn't go to film school, but I, I cost the Fox Network fifty million dollars in failed shows, which was my film school. <laughs> I think my big break was during the two thousand seven WJ strike, when they canceled our overall deals. So I was at Paramount, and they canceled our deal after that force majeure thing. Force majeure got the letter. The studios were trying to get movies going. Right after that, I was offered if you write this script, you can direct it. And as you know, many of your audience members know, the studios always do that old chestnut that oh, we'll let the writer direct it. And I said, no, 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 but I really want to direct it. Which I think is often a kiss of death, by the way. When, sure. When writers went direct because there's not that objectivity, I find, and it's all very precious. But in your case, not well, so. Well, coming from television, you, nothing I have is precious, right? That's why I constantly change words. You're a dream to work with. As a person who is selected and lucky enough to work on your movies doing the research on them, you listen to the audience, man. You. Mm -hmm. And you don't get precious. You're like, what works? That's not working. That's not landing. That comes from television. That huh? comes from the sheer volume of stories you have to write and produce and direct in television that nothing is precious. And just because you heard it in your head a certain way, there's a big difference between a script and, and when you film something. And a lot of writers and a lot of executives always kind of talk about the script, even though when it's filmed already. And I fully believe that once you start filming, there's no script. It's what you're seeing when you're shooting it. So if you have that mindset, I don't care if I wrote it this way or someone wrote it this way, let's see what works. And the same in the testing, even though I filmed it this way and I cut it this way, if you go to an audience and we can talk about testing because I'm obsessed with it, when you look at an audience and they don't react a certain way, that's the most honest they're ever going to be. I believe that the cards aren't honest. I believe that people's reactions are honest in the real time. So if they're reacting a certain way in that moment, that is the purest most beautiful part of our business. And you're not asking them how you feel. You're not prodding it. You're just judging how they're feeling. And if it doesn't go well, you have to fix it. You made a comment on the way up here in the elevator. I was congratulating you on a very successful screening you had last night. I was not at the screening, but you didn't take my compliment when I said, and you went up like 10 points and you're excellent. And you definitely recommend went up like 15 points or something. And so you said the audience, tell us, the audience played really hot, right? Yeah. So we had a preview last night in Las Vegas, which we do just because it's not the tourists, it's the people who live in Las Vegas. Um, and it was an incredible screening. It felt like a rock concert. The, it was it, it was laughing and clapping and crying and everything. It was, the, it was an incredible screening. You learned a lot. So when they weren't doing that, you know something's wrong. But- if I were to walk out of that screening and predict what do you think the numbers were, my numbers that I would have predicted were su were substantially higher than what we actually. They couldn't got. get that much higher. Let's well, be serious. It, it, they so that's where I'm just. They could have got higher. Slap your wrist a little here. So so I'm trying to. As I saw you in the elevator. I'm trying to figure out why. I just love you. Measure you, why I love you so much is because you're relentless. Like you want to get to a hundred percent. I mean, I'm not even kidding. It's so funny. You're like. Already it's in a really good place, but that really excites me as a researcher because what can we then uncover right. for you that's going to allow you to even lean into something more or whatever it may be. But often I tell a lot of filmmakers, don't be seduced by either way, an audience that is super hot, mm -hmm. but an audience that's not, but might rate it higher. They're just a different audience composition, different psychographics, you know, behaviors and attitudes that may make them laugh at certain things or not. 
because the scores are the scores, and that ultimately has that wonderful correlation that we're all trying to get, which is that definite recommend, which is bringing this full circle, and then ultimately that box office multiple, the right. legs. How long is that movie going to stay in theaters? When we come back, I want to talk about your switch into motion pictures from television. We'll be back in a moment. Get a glimpse into a secret part of Hollywood that few are aware of and that filmmakers rarely talk about. In the new book, Audienceology by Kevin Getz. Each chapter is filled with never before revealed inside stories and interviews from famous studio chiefs, directors, producers, and movie stars, bringing the art and science of Audienceology into focus. Audienceology, how moviegoers shape the films we love. From Tiller Press at Simon & Schuster, Available now. We're back with Will Gluck, the funny Will Gluck. I'm really curious about something. So Easy A, right. Friends with Benefits, uh, Annie, but then you go to Peter Rabbit. Like, I was really curious. I remember when I was given that testing assignment, why you chose to do that movie, because it is not in your the wheelhouse that at least you set up prior to that. And, that, and that's interesting about why... Going back to your earlier question, to me, it was so obvious, and I think why I'm not in the club. Um, I don't define myself, as people know me, of as my career. I define myself of, of my family. So if you look at my body of work, it's all the stages of my kids and my family. So the first movie I did, I mean, I television, the kids were very young. They were babies. And then... The first movie I did, it was just the first movie I could do because you get your first gig, whatever you do. And then from then on, it became, okay, so Easy A is about high school. Friends of Benefits was an R-rated, which is what I like, romantic comedy. Oh, my my kids are now sentient. And, How and old are your kids? So now they're 18 and 20. So at that moment, so if you follow my career, it's uh -huh. like I want to do everything with my kids. I think that's fascinating. So my kids are in every one of my movies as extras. It's not a Nepo baby. They absolutely hate it. They're never going to go in this business, but it's it's a way of being- No, they're a, going to Asian studies. It's going to Asian studies. It's home movies. It's very expensive home movies. So Annie, my kids were all over. So all the songs we did with my kids. And then the next one, well, they got a little bit older. So the Peter Rabbit. And they're now leaving. I'm back to our writer romantic comedies. So- I That's want to really fascinating, and it makes absolute and utter sense right. when I think of it. So you never did things for your agent saying, we need you to do this. We would strongly encourage no. you to do that. I want to do things that I can come home and talk to my family about and have them be participating in and bring them on set and have them help and do like this. And now the movie I'm making right now, Anyone With You, is an already romantic comedy, but my daughters are squarely in the demographic. So- I listen to them more than much to the chagrin of the studio and my editors much more than anything else because there's no more honest person than your children. Can I say, I believe you. I believe when you say that because yeah. I know how honest kids can be and they don't have anything except the question at hand. They don't need to like you more or right. gain your favor or whatever it is that other people always have some kind of agenda. What about Annie? Annie was interesting. Annie was, again, the family moved to New York, so that was fun. That was probably my most challenging movie. Every movie I make, I have so much fun on the set. I have a lot of directors, friends of mine, who are always miserable, and they say it was terrible. I said, I, how can this be miserable? This is the most fun thing in the world, and I'm lucky to be in a situation that I don't want people over my back, for better or for worse. Most people will say for worse. I have control issues, so I do everything myself. So it's, a, it's the most fun business in the world, and you get paid for it. Annie was a little bit, there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen. I came in kind of late, late to the process. I always thought of Annie as my superhero movie. So that was the we, kind of way I looked at how, it. How do you mean by, what do you mean by that? Um, I never, uh, much to my agent chagrin, I'm not, I don't really love superhero movies that much. Mm -hmm. So during that time I was offered kind of stuff and I couldn't get my head around it, but I did want to do a big movie that kind of felt that way. And Annie has the music and Got the it. IP and the built in. So had you seen the musical when you were a kid? Oh, for, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the... Alvin Ailey? Alvin Ailey Theater. It came back a couple times, too. I saw the original. Andrew McArdle? Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. And then Sarah Jessica Parker did it. Yeah. I love that movie that they did. The, that Anne Ranking was in and, the, and the, uh, the Carol Kathy Burnett. Bit. Oh, the original one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you use those songs, by the way, that were in the... Uh, so we redid all the songs with Sia. It was a great time because Jay-Z produced it with Will Smith. 
and Sia did the music for it. So we changed all the songs. I think we changed it too much. And if we're really going to get into this, that was the first time that it was not well received for a lot of reasons, a lot of which were very disheartening. You mean racist? Yeah. Yeah, I know. We had the same recent backlash, I think, on Little Mermaid. Right. And I was right. appalled, right. embarrassed right. for the world and applauded, truly applauded Disney for for doing that. But yet it's just like ridiculous that we are having these conversations in 2023. It's, yeah. It's not even the bravery, how could being bravery is making a movie. And that movie in particular, because my oldest daughter at that moment was Annie's age and and she looks like Annie and her hair, We for, for the actress playing Annie, Kofan J. Wallace, her, her wig was based on my daughter's hair. So every time I saw her in the oh, back, I saw my I daughter. That. that was a tricky beast, that movie. It was really fun. And I love all the actors I was going to say, did you ultimately have fun on yeah, the set? It's, yeah, and before. it was in New York City, the streets of New York City. It was oh the most, it was God. really singing and dancing. It was fun. Do um, you ever pinch yourself and go, yeah, I'm at the helm here? I'll tell you when. In that movie, I decided to film it all in my neighborhood where I grew up. So that was all filmed. A lot of it was filmed right where I grew up. And so you, you're filming with this gigantic camera crew and you're on the street. You walked home from school up every day. by Columbia. Right at Columbia. 116th Street that's, or something? That's where I grew up, 116th. So we grew Damn. Up, we shot a lot of it there. And that was kind of cool. That yeah. is just, what a great it's story. Great. Yeah. Easy A was really well received and it did extremely well. What was that new success like for you? The fun part about that was that I was going through with Emma at the same time. We both kind of look, kept looking at each other in all the different press screenings and the reward shows going, can you believe this is happening? So that was kind of fun to have it going through with some. But it was it was strange. But I'm also, as you maybe can guess, I'm very cynical. So when someone says they like something or congratulations, you mean I just throw that away. I literally throw that away. I mean, even when I see your I – this morning I was going through all the cards, which we get at the end of test screenings. The questionnaires. The questionnaires. From the screening. And I never – look at the positives. I throw them in the garbage. I never look at them. Oh. I'll tell you why. It's not helpful. When someone says to you, this is good, that's not helpful whatsoever. What's only helpful is what didn't you like? Because someone tells you, hey, I like that. I don't care. But on that note, you know what I tend to tell filmmakers? And I've said this for those of you who are listening and have been through a test screening with me, know that I ask and encourage you to read the very good cards not the excellence, the very goods and the goods. But I also tell you not to really read the fairs and the poors. Sometimes I'll say the fairs, but almost always in my experience, the fairs are, and certainly the poors are not convertible. So the mm. value you get is in letting the goods and the very goods wash over you. Because the idea is that the next screening, you're going to boost those up, right. which is in turn, again, this is the theme of this, which is, you want to get that definite recommend score, which means you want to move everything up towards your excellent. And that is super important. I agree. We're basically saying the same thing. We are. It's how are we getting – yeah. You're uh, just harder on yourself. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what can you do with positivity? How does that help anything? Well, I guess not much would be the answer. Friends with Benefits was fun, huh? Really fun. That was a blast. I loved that movie. That was a blast. I, and she shocked me as being so – The best. Like cool and – yeah. Like, just great. They're both the best. And that was one of the first movies that it was just us three making the movie. And they would continue to be the best. And I saw it the other day because I was trying to find something. You could see how much fun they're having you on You mean the like screen. a music cue or something? An ADR cue, how I did the ADR thing. I have the same editor on almost all my movies, and she did that one too, so we we're looking at it. But you could tell, like Friends of Benefits, like the movie we just made, you could tell how much fun they had making the movie. The first thing you said to me in the last preview is, how is the chemistry? And I said, it's there because they love being with each other, you know, playing, acting with each other. I'm That's saying right. everybody, everyone relax, <laughs> everybody relax. And it shows. I don't believe that anyone can fake that. I movie. completely agree with you. And I did bring that up to you because having worked on everything from Pretty Woman right. to When Harry Met Sally and Sleepless in Seattle and so many of those great romantic comedies, if you don't have that at right. the center of your romantic comedy, you're effed. Right. You're right. just screwed. And that was yesterday, you know, the chemistry and everyone love all the Well, that's the you. Pillars. I want to say you're really good at that, man. Well, I just like to You're going to hear something good whether you like it or not. <laughs> and you're going to like it. Well, if you, <laughs> if you spend all your time with the studio executives, which I do, you think you're a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> it is really hard to be a studio executive right now because there's so many unknowns and there's so much clutter and noise out there. Right. Every decision is like become so much more important than just taking a flyer. I, I would absolutely agree. And I've been with the same studio for 14 years. I've been at Sony 14 years. So 
some of this. That means you have a deal. I have an Sony. overall deal at Sony. My company's there, and I've made eight movies for Sony only. Every movie I've ever made has only been Sony. What's Olive Bridge, by the way? That's the small town in upstate New York where we got married. Oh, yeah. sweet. Okay. It's, it's my little bit of whimsy, as my friend said. Yeah, I like Will that. has a little bit of whimsy. So anyway. So everyone has been there for many, many years. And the thing I like about Sony is when you're making a movie for them, what you just said is that they're nervous, but you can work together with them to try to get the best. I never felt like they have a different agenda, except for one thing, which I'm going to bring up to you in a second. I never thought they had a different agenda than making the movie successful. I never felt like, oh, they're going to screw up my movie. They don't want to do this because I know that all they want to do is succeed as well. So once I kind of understood that and I really liked the people there, the dialogue opens up. So when you go have a screening yesterday and we're coming back on the on the whichever pl- way we got back from Vegas to L.A. yesterday. What do you mean whichever way? What did you go by? By pigeon? What did you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Private jet? You, you, don't, you don't want to say that on a podcast. We're just trying to make a living. Oh, we're my just, God. We're just a lunch pail. The way I say it is a private jet is much more efficient for a lot of very well-paid people's time. You don't want to spend time going on a commercial If plane. someone said to me, I will write you a check for $1,800 if you drive home, I will take the check and drive home. Anyway, the point is yeah. you're going back in there and it really And once is... you go private, you don't want to ever go any other way. I'm sorry. Kevin, you are. You I'm are sorry. I, I, you. I your fancy building with the elevator. Anyway, even though they kind of – they all want to make a good movie together. They all want to yeah. make it successful. So you can have a push and pull. And what I like about them is you could they, could they say something to you and you say, well, that's the wrong diagnosis. What's the that's the wrong prescription? What's the diagnosis? Yes. And, and 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 because they kind of trust me at this moment, it's really fun. I never feel nervous at a test because most people when they go to the test, they're testing for one reason. Does the studio marketing care about this movie? I never felt that way. That's amazing. Even if I mean, they're really, they're, I got to say, truly, they're my pals, and I've been working with them so closely right. for so long. And Tom Rothman, let's face it, is he's one of a kind. He's so, to me, authentic and tells you what he feels, tells you what he, you know, means, means what he says, mm-hmm. and has great conviction, but a great respect for the audience. Like, he gets it. He knows what is theatrical and Sanford and Josh and they really understand that and Ange they they have a passion for that yeah they do and and thing about Tom is that we have arguments all the time about script phase like I said to you earlier I don't like this I don't like this oh my god it's terrible and then you go to the you go to the screening and it works he goes all right it works he'll never he never stands on ceremony he just wants do you it know to how succeed. many stories I can tell you over the years that that has happened I remember Bob Shea and Wedding crashes back in the day saying, oh, I don't think this is going to work. And, and and it was such a hit. And and he, I heard him saying, you know, I was wrong. Oh, I yeah. Was, you know. Right, right. But they don't say and I that's was. that's a cool executive, That's by a the cool way. executive. That, that's someone who's saying, you know, I acknowledge what I said and compliments the. Yes. The, but what I have brought up to source. Tom many times is like, Tom, you, I wish you would just say you were wrong with this, a little bit of the same intensity of the 10,000 notes going up to it. You have to match a little bit of the intensity. I want you to say you were wrong 5,000 times, <laughs> just half as many times. as. But he's – yeah, he just wants to make – and even if he doesn't understand something, if the audience understands it, he gets it. I, I just love working Not with him. Not to be too fawning over Mr. Yeah. Rothman, but there have been times when he will acquiesce 100 percent if you can make a good case. Mm-hmm. But don't try to bring bullshit in and expect it to be bought. Like if I have data and I have a reason to stand up for something, I'll stand up for it. And he will listen Mm -hmm. and ultimately do what's right by the person that has the numbers or the experience or whatever it is. I find him always to be that guy and just I love him. But I would also say he's so many times to my chagrin – He's right about something that I said he's he's out of his mind. Oh, I know it's and, and I he makes that. me shoot on this movie. <laughs> and on this movie, he there's one moment there that he wants me to shoot a different way, and I said no, 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 I'm not going to do it. And so we get to the set. And I'm like, all right. I mean, for the actors, like this is for Rothman. Let's shoot this stupid shoot the scene this way. No one's just do one take. We don't give a shit. I even said in the camera, this is for you, Tom. Shoot it. Throw in the garbage. Cut it. Preview. Screening. 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 This happened last screening, the one you one went to. One of the to. funniest things in the movie? Uh, no, no. And then it, something didn't work. And I was like, oh, I know why this doesn't work because it should have been done that way. And they went back to the cutting room, did the one <gasps> take one, which is the opening of our movie. And I called Tom and said, God damn it. You oh, made me do this yes. thing and is right about it. And that's a story thing that I was yelling at him and I'm glad I did it. Well, a note to your agents. I just believe you've re-upped your Sony deal no. for the next three years. 
<laughs> Tom's smarter than that. He doesn't give a shit about this. I know. I know. <laughs> oh, so any particular thing you can share with us about anyone but you, like the casting on it, how you got to do that movie as your next project? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, a re- no one's going to see romantic comedies in theaters, period. No one's going to theaters, period. That's a whole different discussion. But we... That movie came together. It's with Sidney Sweeney and Glenn Powell. Sidney Sweeney's from... Are there two any more sexy people right now on the planet? That I would say no. And together that even is exponential. It doesn't get lower. And they're great. And they're also I mean, great people. Glenn Powell is a star. Star. And wait to this movie he just made, Hitman. He is so terrific. Yeah. When I saw him in Maverick, I was like, yeah. holy cow. Yeah. Like, he just has it. He's the best. He's the best. Sidney's the best. So we decided like where to put it and a lot of other people wanted it. Streamers wanted it. But I said, I want to take a shot. I convinced everyone to, to – Sony wanted it. They want to take a shot at it. So as I told everyone in this cast and the crew, like this might be the last romantic comedy ever in theaters, guys. So Well, until one really breaks out and then suddenly they can really work again. Right. I mean that's what it takes is is that one. But I agree with you right now. It's a very challenging genre. I think it's because so many of them either don't have that special sauce because there are not a lot of movie stars anymore. Mm-hmm. And you actually put a, together a pretty dynamic couple at the moment. They're kind of right in that. Yeah. But also, in fairness, as of this interview, we are in a strike. Mm-hmm. And WJN said strike. And it's scary because actors can't promote the movies. That's and right, right now, I think it's scheduled for December. We mm-hmm. shall see if that holds. We're hoping right. Yeah, and also when I was, I'm also a director and a writer. So once the writer strike ended, and started, oh, you were a director and, and writer. <laughs> I'm joking. But my point is, I couldn't do any writing on the movie after it locked. So when we wrapped, the strike went in a week later, and that was it. So now we can't do any. Now the SAG works, we can't do any ADR. So it's hard making a movie when you can't write or oh, or do ADR. Please solve this. Right. We all want. So we're we all for want resolution. So we have all this stuff we really want to do, but I we know, can't do anything. I know, but. The reason why this movie is going to work in theaters, I believe, is because everyone wants to go have fun and, and with, with people again. All the movies they've always watched in romantic comedies have been streamers. They're all at home. Streamers, 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 streamers. So we tried everything to make this a big event. And hopefully, if the strike's ever over, we can do it. Well, from your mouth to God's ears, what would you say is your superpower? The most fun I have in this business and my, what I believe, not a superpower, but I guess a semi-power, a micro-power, is... When we're actually filming and the cameras are on, is changing lines and changing attitudes and changing scenes on the fly in real time. That is the one thing that... And being able to direct that. Immediately. Immediately. Yeah. And saying, let's try this way, this way. And you can... And a lot of stuff in the movie is because of the stuff... I, like I said earlier, there's a page and it's, it's the shooting. And when you're on a scene and you're in the middle of the Blue Mountains in Australia filming something, there's no way that it could have been what you planned on the script. So you have to see what you're filming, see what's going on, see what the attitude is, see what they're wearing, and, and pivot. And if that, to me, is what feels the most realistic, and that's the most fun for me. Say, well, this I know we wrote the scene this way. Let's stop. Let's write the scene really quickly. Put it over here and just redo it. And that's my superpower. And that's what not superpower, my micro power. And that's what I love doing. And much again to the studio, I get calls all the time. Say, where is this scene in the movie? Well, this wasn't in the script, but this daily as we saw. I said, oh yeah, I know, but we just we thought about it last night. Are you a hard get? For people that want you to direct their stuff, do you? I'm not you, in the club, Kevin. I'm not a hard get. I'm just happy to be working. That is so. Just happy to be working. Full, all your, false all your, humility. all your guests. False humility. Those guests you've had are they're all in the club. They all know each other. They all help. They're all in the club. I'm not in the club. Well, I think you're in the club, and the reason I say that is because everybody knows you, and that right there gets you in the club, and also respect you, and you're really a fine. Writer and director. Well, let me ask you a question. Oh, Lord. About testing. Okay, shoot. Have you ever been told by a studio to kind of shift the results a certain way to let the filmmaker be aware of what they want? I would be lying to say that people didn't try to move me in a certain direction. But the reason that I've been doing this for three and a half decades Mm -hmm is, I think this Tom actually said this, true north. Mm -hmm. I really believe that I have to stay, like Switzerland, Mm -hmm. neutral, and take that noise, Mm -hmm. which I find to be noise in, 
know that I have the information. So if the probe might come naturally, I would work it in, but I'm not going to manipulate any results ever in favor of a studio or a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would lose my... I don't mean results. I mean like in the focus group. Yeah, even in the probing. I mean, again, you get... It's uh, what you feel. It's what your gut when you're watching it. It's... No, it's... Honestly, it's... And I, I don't want to sound corny. It, it's the audience. Is well, it's a, it's what you felt the audience. I have an agenda to go in and ask a battery of questions. Mm-hmm. If you notice, uh, not one of my focus groups looks like the other focus mm-hmm. group, except for some basic initial questions. How did you rate it overall? What are your thoughts and feelings? Give me a word or phrase that describes it. What are your favorite scenes and parts, characters? But then I let them, and a word they bring up will move me into that and move me into right. that. And then I'll steer it back to if you didn't rate the movie higher, why not? Mm-hmm. And I typically will talk about pace, ending, and confusions, which are the three major areas that everyone wants Isn't to Isn't that the name about. of your next book, Pacing, Ending, and Confusion? That's not a bad idea. No, it's actually called, ready for this? How to Score in Hollywood. Oh, that's a good one. So that's a funny name. That's a good one. That's a good one, yeah. So in any event, the answer is people have tried to influence that, but I absolutely cannot let that happen. Now, let me ask you this with the focus group. Does that give you any feeling of yes, it does. security or? I mean, I've no, been. Seriously. Yes. I believe the focus groups, tell me if I'm wrong, but the beginning questions that you ask are non to just getting people warm. Well, back. they're designed to be positive. We start yes, with the positives. Right, right. We want to get them not ragging on anything because right, right. every single movie does have a superpower and every single movie does have really good things about it. And I want to uncover those. Right. So part of, I think, why you're sitting here and we're buddies is because there's this trust that I'm not going to bury you because I want to help you. Yeah, right. I want to mine anything I can. So you know this as an actor or working with actors as well. The last thing I say is my super objective in this focus group is to get the most information I possibly can mine from this group. It's the last thing I say to myself before I go on every single night and done over 5,000 titles is how can, and if I don't get that, I have failed. Right. And I fail every now and again. There's just, it's a lousy group. Yeah. They can't really articulate it. Maybe I'm off. But by and large, that is my objective. So I need to tease that out. I need to ask it relentlessly, maybe, any way I can to try to get it. Have you ever, and even a movie that's a, a Oscar-winning masterpiece, you still, at the end of the focus group, get some bad things. Always, right. there's something. Right. If you ask someone, you're going to get something. It's like asking a lawyer to look over a document right. that another lawyer has done. They're right. always going to add additional red lines to that because that's what they do. Right, right. You know what I mean? It's just part of the whole thing. The thing is, if there's not commonalities, you know, you can usually toss those comments aside. They're kind of noise. I look for commonalities. I look for themes. Right. I look for directional things. And that's, I think, the way that filmmakers can best come to terms with the data by putting their own fixes on what they're hearing. Mm -hmm. Every now and then they'll say, what do you mean? And by example, I'll say, well, in another movie we did, I know they did this or this or this, or my suggestion would be to to contemplate this or maybe do a character pass because they don't seem to be getting the full arc of the protagonist. They may say to me, can you give us an example of that? And I go, not really. It's just throughout the movie. Right. Right. You guys solve it. You know, yeah, I'm yeah. Not, I don't say that either, but that's the implication. Yeah, that's the one thing I think a filmmaker's superpower, a lot of them are, and used to be mine until I got older, is explaining away testing. You should see in the cutting room and in the studio and other directors and say, well, this is because of that. And this is because of that. And this is they didn't know. This is a blind test. And so you have to admit some of it is can be explained away, but most of it, there's a reason for it. So the hard emotional part be going like, they don't like this guy. They don't like this guy. And then you say, oh, well, because he's the villain. They're not supposed to like this guy. Well, no, if they like they like the bad Listen, villains. When Forrest played Idi Amin, yeah. it was one of the highest testing exactly. characters we've and ever he's tested. Idi Amin. And he's Idi Amin. Right. So right. that's all I have to say about right. that. No, they should like meaning they the characters they right. like the way the bad guy is bad they right. like the way the good guy is a hero and investing or the woman who's just a badass or whatever it is uh those are important right but it it is and it's hard to kind of push that aside the next day when you talk about everything and actually go what is the root and also as you well know the, as I said earlier, the diagnosis is usually accurate, almost always accurate. The prescription is almost always inaccurate. And even when I have my friends come to – I do a roundtable before I 
about to shoot with all my friends just just who care about uh-huh. my movie. Uh-huh. They're not getting paid. They just get, I say to them. I help them in their movie. I say to them, just so you guys know, we're going to pitch on this movie. Not one thing you guys pitch is going to be in the movie. It never is. But it starts to help us to think about what it is. Yeah. And what's I the actually problem. I have a very funny feeling about directors giving other directors notes. I just – I've never found it all that um, mm. helpful. I don't think innately there's an honesty. I think that it's just um, – they all know the pain. They all know – the the feeling of what it is like that they're exposing their babies. And I just think there's a camaraderie, a sisterhood, a brotherhood, whatever it is. And I think that is like not the best barometer. That's true. Yeah. And so that's just my experience. And I don't love family and friends screenings as a result of that. I like always recruited audience screenings, small ones. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a filmmaker should have the ability to just have like a really tight, 50 person, 100 oh, yeah. person screening just to work out the kinks before you show it to the oh, studio. Yeah. I mean, I've screened my movies five, six, seven times before I, love I do that. a preview. I love that. But here's one question for you, too, which I've learned. When I do those 100 people, 99 seat theater screenings, I never tell them that we're going to be talking to them afterwards or they get filling out a card. And I've done a couple of control groups. One time we did tell that. And the time that we didn't tell that when we started talking to them, it was much more honest. And the time that we told them you're going to be talking about it, their hands shot. It became a gender studies class. They were ready to talk about this because you're, if you know you're going to evaluate something at the end of a meal, if you're going to review it, you're reviewing it differently than just like, hey, how would you like that meal on the way out? That's why I believe – I always tell us the studio – I believe post-track is the most – Pure version of you mean exit polls? Yes, when you yeah. walk out, you paid for a service. You want to feel good about yourself, but it's just hey, you like it? What? No, yes or no? You like it? One to five. That is much pure. So I right before I always lock a movie, I do a post track. I show the movie and I walk out. What did you do? Because that to me is going to have its legs, and it's not asking you right. to talk about gender studies. It's just asking you, you like it or not. Right. Well, that may be true. It may not be. But I will tell you this. Because we do every movie the same way, right. all the normative data works in service of yes, that true. methodology so that you're fine by doing it that way. You see what I mean? But if you were inconsistent here and did it here and did it there, right. that's why I like to keep as many of the variables the same because right. it's all about the norms. In other words, you could have a completely skewed sample of just the same thousand people that you – for every single movie – and as long as they put it in the same, you know, and right. they're representative, let's say, of the U.S. pop, you can probably get as useful as information if you are dealing with the norms based on that particular sample set. Right. I just wish it wasn't called testing. I know. It's a, a laboratory, maybe. Yeah. I like to say you have your laboratory. Feedback. I mean, it's the same way as I know. at Sony. I always yell at them. They, after, I know. When, when you have a preview, before you finish yeah. the preview, they they schedule what's called a Postmortem. I know. And I said, guys, got to, do you know what postmortem that, means? First of all, I love that you said that. Where did that term Stop calling it a postmortem. We be. haven't even done it yet. It's probably going to die, but let's just ha- try it Really? First. If you look, postmortem is That's what associated they call it. with death. Of course. Not I associated know. with death. That's what it means. All I can think of is I'm praying and hoping that I didn't come up with that years no, ago. I think it's many. I think oh, it's it has to be way 50s, before. 50s, it feels like. Oh, it's great. Yeah, I mean, because yeah, yeah. I, I hate to be responsible they for that. They still call it that. But I call it that as well. So and I, I'm calling gonna, it that. I know. I'm going to reef. I'm going to leave today. Post screening feedback. Post screening feedback is a mouthful. Can we get it down to two words? Feedback. No, that doesn't work. Uh, We're going to have a feedback call. Post screening. A post screening call. Yeah, post screening. Yeah. There we are. Yeah. You heard it here, folks. Fascinating. Riveting. Just incredible. Pull your Even car now. off the side of the road. Will, we can go on for hours. You are such a great guy. I am so honored to know you and privileged to work on your movies. And I think I've worked on nearly all of them. Yes. And Annie, I did not do. But um, Why didn't you know Annie? I don't know. It was just wherever the studio sure? was at the time. I didn't do it. My company might company, have done it. Yeah, but I, I personally yeah, didn't yeah, do it. Yeah, but you so. definitely your company. But usually I try to be at all your screenings because you always just light the room up. And I really do appreciate you. So thank you so well, thank much. Thank you for doing this. And I like your podcast. And I want your guests to be more honest. Well, <laughs> who's my next guest? I'm I want you to challenge <laughs> every one of your guests that says, oh, he's a great friend of mine or she's a great friend of mine. Ask the follow-up question. What does that mean? Just probe them a little bit. Can I tell you one thing? My connective tissue on this podcast, I realized it took me six months to really find what it was, is I have to know you. Yeah, oh, for sure. If I don't know you, 
And so everyone is a friend. They may not be the one that I share my deepest, darkest secrets with, but everyone's a friend. No, no, a friend of yours. What I'm saying is when they're bringing up people, if you were to listen to this podcast, oh. you would think that everyone in Hollywood is the best friend and has everyone else's best That's interests nice in mind. nice love. We're promoting yeah. love. It's all bullshit. <laughs> Will Gluck, <laughs> thank you. To our listeners, I hope you enjoyed our interview. I encourage you to check out Will Gluck's Hulu and Disney Plus shows and to see his upcoming new film, as we just mentioned, Anyone But You, later this year. For other stories like this one, please check out my book, Audienceology, at Amazon or through my website at kevingets360.com. You can also follow me on my social media at kevingets360. Next time on Don't Kill the Messenger, I'll welcome entertainment marketing veteran and former CBS Films Chief, Terry Press. Until then, I'm Kevin Getz, and to you, our listeners, I appreciate you being part of the movie-making process. Your opinions matter.